Hey, this is Mark Pattison back with another episode of Finding Your Summit. And this week we have an epic guest. This guy's name is Scott Perezinski. And uh, I've met and been around a lot of super impressive people in my day, but this guy might be at the top of the list. Grew up overseas, Tehran, Beirut, and Greece. Ended up going to uh, Stanford, was there down there for 10 years, became a uh, medical student, and then entered the uh, NASA program, applied because of his wide range of different skills that he had. Uh, They wanted to bring him aboard. He's been in space, spent over 40 hours doing spacewalks, multiple missions, hung out with John Glenn, was the coach of the Olympic team for the Philippines in the luge. How does that connection happen? I don't know. And then of all things, he's out climbing mountains. He's done uh, every single mountain, uh, the high mountain 14er in Colorado and did Mount Everest. Took him twice to do that. But we go through each one of these different things, these different phases of his life and you know, I just love hearing the stories of these guys with accomplishment. And, you know, like me and everybody else, you go through a few uh, hard knocks, but it's what you learn and what you take away from that as you go forward. So it's just such a pleasure to speak with Scott. I think you're going to love this episode. And as always, just remember to go out, rate, and review. We love it. We love the love. And it really helps us in terms of the rankings and whatnot. So if you can do that through iTunes, uh, it is greatly appreciated. So, Here we go. Hang on. I'm talking to one of the most talented guys I think I have ever come across. And um, Scott Perezinski is with us. And just to give you a little setup, this guy is an astronaut, a medical doctor. He's climbed Everest. He's been all over the world. Uh, I just found out he's also was a, a, a coach um, in the, uh, the Olympics for Luge, I think the Philippine, Philippine team and whatnot. So, uh, Scott, I've had a lot of people say to me, Mark, you know, very impressive what you've done over your time playing in the NFL, starting these different businesses, starting one venture back, selling it and climbing the, uh, the seven summits. And I've always taken that in like, gosh, I feel like I haven't really done anything. In this case, talking to you right now. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worthy, Mark. No, uh, mutual admiration, absolutely. Uh, but I'm, I'm honored to be on your show. This is going to be a lot of fun. Oh, man, this is so great. So uh, I am uh, talking to you from Pacific Palisades in California. You're in Houston, and that I'm sure has a tie with your astronaut stuff. Um, Houston, we have a problem, but right now, right now. So, um, <laughs> not today. So yeah, so you know, so I was digging into your your um, just everything you've been doing and where you're from, and, and, and I just really want to understand. You're such a driven guy, and that doesn't just happen, um, you know, out of the blue. And um, there must be a drive. And the first thing that really jumped off the page to me was, you know, here's a guy that didn't have the all American grow up experience in you know Cleveland, Ohio, or you know somewhere in Michigan, or in my case Seattle, um, but uh, you grew up in all parts of the world, Beirut. I mean, who does that? The Senegal. I mean, <laughs> wow. I mean, just dangerous spot, spots too. Well, some of them were, and we, we didn't know it, of course, when we moved there. We thought, well, you know, how, how uh, exciting would this be to live in West Africa or in the Middle East? And at the time when we moved there, of course, they were uh, you know, wonderfully safe, uh, dramatic places to go live. But then after we arrived, uh, uh, you know, in Beirut, for example, we, we had to evacuate after six months because the, the civil war began uh, when my folks decided, well, they're opening up a new office in Tehran, Iran. Um, let's go check, check that out. Uh, a few months after we arrived there, same thing happened. So a bunch of my friends actually joked. They, they thought that my dad worked for the CIA because we're always moving to these places that, you know, trouble would, would erupt. But uh, my dad assures me that that wasn't the case. So what did <laughs> what did he do? He sold uh, aircraft for the Boeing airplane company. So we have a, a Seattle uh, tie in common, actually, sure. Mark. But uh, um, yeah, so Boeing is a very international company, and my folks were very, very adventurous. And I think that's what kind of set me up on the path that I've taken in my life is, um, you know, life is an incredible gift. It's an adventure uh, to be to be savored and, and uh, pursued. And so um, and I think also just a sense of uh, curiosity that's driven me to to try new things, be willing to fail every once in a while. Yeah, well, I'm trying to find where you did fail. You know, I mean, you're, oh, I, you're, did. <laughs> I mean, well, let's get into it. You know, finding your summit is really about 
you know, that whole we've we've got different segments in life and, and you're a high achiever and I've done some things too, but um, everybody's got their story, right? And it's not just about, you know, you're in space and doing these other amazing things, but it's also about how you had to overcome, right, on these different right. th- these these different journeys. So um interested to to get into that. So okay, so now you're you're living in different parts of the world and uh your high school years were overseas or in the States? They're overseas. So I spent uh most of my time in Athens, Greece, and then I spent the first part of my senior year in Tehran which is right at the start of the Islamic Revolution. Bad time to be there, uh, late 78. And, uh, and so that was kind of, a, what, I guess, one of the big challenges that I had to overcome growing up is moving every few years. Uh, you've got to pick up, meet new uh, friends, uh, you know, adjust into a new environment. And, of course, it was really difficult going through it at the time, but it gave me a skill set that I think has really helped me as, a, as an entrepreneur and as a business person, uh, you know, being able to speak to lots of different people, to, to relate to people. Uh, but it was hard uh, as a kid doing that. Did you play sports? I did, yes. Basketball and track were my main sports. I, I actually tried to play football. Um, I was a horrible failure at it, I'll be perfectly honest. Uh, I, I didn't grow up playing football. So uh, senior year, uh, uh, when we arrived in Iran, they actually had uh, football teams. And so I, I was pretty fast and athletic, so I tried out for the team and Said, well, you know, you're pretty lanky uh, and long, and uh, why don't you try and be a wide receiver? Well, found out that I really have a, a real, really serious uh, uh, self protection instinct. <laughs> and uh, so whenever uh, guys started running at me, I, you know, I, I would kind of wince, and, and I was a pretty easy guy to catch. Uh, and so I, I was a, uh, not the best football player. They ended up uh, making me, uh, um, what did I play? I was uh, um, a nose guard, and then I, I was the kicker. So I had a pretty good leg, but that, that's all I could ever do in your sport. Well, we, we actually have something in common. Actually, uh, I was the same way too. I, I would, you know, wince as people would come with me. The only difference is that I could outrun the field. <laughs> it sounds like I'm not sure you could. So that's the only thing that kept going, you know, on, on my end. So, um, no, that's great. So, and, you know, I always believe that sports really is that unifier in a lot of cases. You know, a new kid comes into town and it's just hard to integrate, especially when these guys have been around and hanging out together for all those years, and then you, you, you insert yourself into a sports team, and it just bonds instantly. Right, absolutely, yeah. So for bas- you know, basketball and track, I was able to do that. I really have a great connection there, and, and I felt part of, some, part of a team. And uh, you know, all the things that I've done in my life, and I, I'm, I'm sure in your life as well, you recognize that the, the really great a- a- accomplishments or achievements in life don't come as an, a solo uh, accomplishment. They're part of a team. And uh, and that shared experience is you know the things that I cherish the most. Wasn't it in 1979 uh, that the Iranian crisis, hostage crisis, came to be? And did had you moved out of there by then, or were you still in Tehran? Uh, we had left in December of '78, uh, and I, I guess it was early spring of '79 uh, uh, when the Shah left the country and and when they took the hostages. In fact, the superintendent of my school, William Keogh, was one of the the hostages that was held for. 440 some odd days in captivity. So really a extraordinary time in history for sure. Yeah. I, I can't even imagine that, you know, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm in, in Southern California right now and I'm the street that's just outside uh, the, the, the fence here is um, sunset. And yeah, um, yeah. back in the day, the Shaw had, when, when he left, he actually came to the States and was living on sunset and I, and I can't remember if the house is still there or not there, but I remember, you know, a uh, number of years ago, I'd drive by it and the place had been torched. So really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. So I, you know, I oh. can't even imagine, you know, in, in the States, it seems to be there's isolated incidents of that. And then just watching the whole thing play out on, on TV. And then when Reagan, Reagan came to, uh, to office, you know, how everything switched over and crazy right. time, right. man. Crazy time. Yeah, it, it really was. Uh, yeah, and t- so for a young kid, uh, being uh, um, you know immortal as as we thought we were back then, it was really kind of an adventure for me. So you know, living in Beirut, Lebanon, as we had earlier uh, during the the beginnings of the civil war, there it was really exciting to to know that you know history is happening around us. This is a, a transition. Uh, of course, my parents were just uh, you know completely besides themselves. Uh, you know, fearing that I would you know get into just some trouble or get into a place where I shouldn't be. But uh, I, I had a pretty good street sense early on back then. Yeah. So then you, you, okay, so after your freshman year of your high school, then you moved back to the States or to the States. Um, and where did you land? Houston? 
so yeah, so I, I moved back uh, after my senior year of high school. We uh, we moved to Seattle, actually Bellevue, Washington. It was from there that I, I went down to California for college. I, I spent my my college years down at Stanford. Yeah, so my uh, you know interesting. So I grew up in Seattle and I went to the University of Washington and in the big high school there. My house actually it looked right across the lake, Lake Washington, right at Bellevue. But beautiful, um, yeah. yeah, no, great spot, especially this time of year. But um, you know, to your point, back in the day, the only thing that kept the lights on in Seattle really was Boeing. And now it's mm-hmm. become such an entrepreneurial uh, community with Microsoft and Amazon and Starbucks and Expedia. Huge and just, tech hub. Huge yeah. tech yeah. hub, yeah. So, okay, so, so you, uh, you go to Stanford, and uh, you know, I think you and I are roughly in the same era. You might be a year or two older, but um, you know, back in the day, John Elway was the quarterback, yeah. and yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I would have loved to go to Stanford, and, and that didn't play out that way. I, I had a scholarship offer to Cal, but uh, you know, Stanford with I'm Elway. I'm glad you didn't go there. I'm glad you didn't. <laughs> I know that's your big rival. <laughs> yeah, that we don't. Yeah, we I wouldn't be on your show if you were a, if you were a, a Cal guy. I'm Cal sorry, Bear, yeah, no, I, I can appreciate that. Well, I, I could see in the future way back when, and so that's the reason why I became a Husky, right? <laughs> yeah, <there laughs> so that's, that's how that played out. But um, you know, Stanford, you know, it, it's interesting. I have this conversation a lot with my buddies, and um, I actually travel with UCLA. Jim Moore is my my best friend, uh, oh, the football wow. team, and I, I serve in a mentorship role with them. And and so you know, the question for me, and it, it there is no right answer here, but you know, besides all the top schools that are out there, the Michigans, the Alabamas, the LSUs, you know, Washington, USC, schools like that, UCLA, if there was one or two schools that you could take on your list that that you went to, right, or you got an offer to, and you would bypass going to maybe a school of higher stature in terms of football-wise, where would you go? And, you know, my answer for me, are there's two, there's two schools, one Stanford and the other one's Harvard. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, yeah. there's just something about you graduate from there, it's on your resume, it just sets you up down the road. Well, I, I got rejected from Harvard, so it wasn't an option for me. So, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you also won't be on a scholarship being offered, you know, to go kick at Michigan either. So yeah, yeah, it all worked that's out. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's great. Okay, so you do your undergrad there, and then tell me about your medical, you know, pursuits. Why was there an interest for you in that field? Well, my grandfather, who I never met, actually, he passed uh, actually before my parents were married. He was an ophthalmologist. uh, But uh, my grandmother was a nurse. And just uh, the stories that she would tell and my family would tell about, um, you know, the capacity to help other people in a time of of crisis really resonated with me. And so I wanted to do something that uh, would in some way uh, benefit other people. It seemed to be uh, a noble profession. Uh, which I still think, even though it's a lot harder to practice, I think today for a lot of reasons, we could have a whole nother podcast on, on healthcare uh, and the challenges in it. But um, I, I think it's a, uh, a wonderful profession. And so uh, I sort of set my sights on, on doing that. And, um, and I, the more I got involved, I, I realized that I really wanted to not just help the patients that might be directly in front of me, but to have some scale to it. So, you know, are there things that I can invent? Is the research that I can do that would benefit an even larger number of people? And so that, that sort of set the bit for me to become an inventor and a product developer, trying to you know, have some scale. So, what, so did you go to, to Stanford Medical School or how did that? I did. Yeah, I, I stayed at Stanford. So I, I, I was a lucky guy. I spent 10 years uh, in Palo Alto on the farm, we called it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, really love that life experience and uh um, yeah, it, it was great to have uh, Elway there during my tenure as well. We, we didn't win all that many games, but yeah. uh, the games were always exciting. So. Oh yeah, yeah. My <laughs> one of my uh, first games, I was I was playing down there, and and um, we were ranked number one in the country. And Elway just went off like he could. And yeah. I remember I was they they showed a shot. Sports Illustrated was there, and they showed a shot. I was on the ground trying to catch him. Actually, it wasn't him. There was a punt return, and I was on the punt return uh, yeah. uh, the punt team. And I was down there, and the shot was this kid running past me, as my head is buried in the in the in the grass and the big clump on my <laughs> top of my helmet. And I was like, "That's not the way to start my you know my my uh, college sports career." But that's the way I played. So what in, in what sector of you know? There's all these different lanes, verticals, whatever you want to call it. You know, within medical school, what was your specialty? Well, so I ended up uh, training in emergency medicine and trauma. Uh, I was really interested in 
And uh, at that point, even back then, becoming an astronaut. And, and so clinically, I was most interested actually in neurosurgery. I, I had had a chance to do rotation in, in neurosurgery. And I'm sorry, my, I'll put this my phone to stun here. Uh, uh, I got a chance to work with some amazing surgeons and uh, you know, help people in, in real crisis. And it, it, really, it really resonated with me. So I was thinking clinically, oh, I, I should go and do that. But I realized that if I wanted to become an astronaut, well, it's a really bad day if you need a brain surgeon in space. Uh, and so I chose something that I also enjoyed, but uh, was broader in its applicability, which is emergency medicine. So were, so, you, so were you already thinking in terms of that connection point of wanting to become an astronaut, even though you're in medical school? Yeah, since I, you know, I, could, I could walk and talk, uh, I, I was fascinated with the space program. My dad worked on the Apollo program when I was very, very young. And so I had a front row seat to... Uh, you know, the, the Apollo launches that first landed men on the moon. And, and I actually saw Apollo 9 launch as a, as a young kid. And so I had that faraway dream of, of maybe one day traveling in space, but uh, I knew it was a long shot. And so what are the things that I could do to uh, kind of increase my odds of becoming an astronaut, but also have not, not a fallback career, but something that I would really enjoy doing. Uh, and that, that was medicine for me. So uh, how do you become a astronaut? So I want to go and uh, I want to do that. I mean, I'm hypothetically, right? And so yeah, you, yeah. You, is there a, like a, you go online and NASA and, you know, there's a little PDF that you fill out and you send in and, you know, <laughs> they take 10 applicants or how does that work? Uh, well, you know, it, I, I think um, it's, it's sort of a self-selecting thing. It's like uh, I'd imagine, you know, preparing yourself for that faraway goal of becoming an NFL, you know, professional athlete. I mean, that's, you know, I don't know what the odds are. One in 10,000, you know, it's really long odds to become a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. You have to have innate ability, drive, determination, and then you've got to apply it over a long period of time. For me, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the base, the, I guess the foundation of it is every two to four years, there would be a, a national call out and um, you could submit an application to NASA based on um, ba a background in science or engineering. And so, uh, each time they would have you know lots and lots of applicants, and um, they would select uh, a limited number of people based on the needs that the program had at the time. So, um, astronauts are physicians, they're engineers, they're scientists, they're pilots, and they like to have a mix of those skills because you know I, I didn't serve as an astronaut just as a physician. I was a um, a spacewalker and a roboticist and a space shuttle flight engineer, and I operated all sorts of different um, experiments, not just in life sciences, but, you know, you have to wear lots of different hats. So I did, you know, uh, combustion physics experiments and material science and many different things. Um, NASA would hire people that are uh, people who have demonstrated aptitude as members of teams, but who had also uh, um, shown, a, you know, kind of a, a broad skill set. Um, and so, uh, for me, that was really exciting to be able to get a chance to learn about lots of different fields and uh, and contribute in, in lots of different areas of science. So uh, yeah, that, yeah, that, 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 I would say that makes sense to me. Just you know, again, based on my limited knowledge, you know, if you're up in space and you need a guy to be kind of the handyman who can do it all, right? Different things come up, and I would imagine you just need to have kind of a wide range skill set to take those you know issues, te technical dif difficulties, or just commanding a the endeavor, whatever, fly back, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sort of, yeah, it's, it's sort of uh, it, uh, they're looking for people who have, uh, you know, kind of, I guess, MacGyver-type skills uh, that, you know, are comfortable with uncertainty because things aren't always going to work the way that you uh, anticipate uh, before the mission. So there are going to be curveballs that are thrown at you. So being, being comfortable in uncertainty and being um, a really strong member of a team, those are the the kind of requirements. So you must be one of the one of the few guys on the planet to ever go to medical school and go down that path and then make the leap, you know, over to becoming an astronaut, right? I think there have been um, a, a buddy of mine, Bernard Harris, and I had dinner just a while ago. He was uh, one of my mentors, actually. Um, he became the very first uh, African American to walk in space, um, and uh, he actually later went on to become a venture capitalist and just a, a really great technologist as well, a brilliant guy. But he was, he and I were talking about this, and I think there have maybe been a, about 16 physician astronauts. Uh, mm. The very first was Joe Kerwin during the Skylab program, and then there have been a, a number since then. Mm. 
Okay, so now you're up in space, and let's talk about what a spacewalker is. I know you've had 40 plus, 40 hours plus in space walking around, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I just can't imagine what that is. And I, I think I read <laughs> one story where you were, you were tethered, um, like, on some 90-foot truss or something at the end of this thing. It's the furthest at the time that any, anybody had ever been away from the mothership. Mm-hmm. So, I mean... I'm I'm trying to understand because most people haven't uh, been in a situation where there's no gravity, right? And mm-hmm. you're you have the ability just to float, and you know you could if if you were to unhook, you'd be at Saturn or someplace right now, right? <laughs> and um, yeah, so, just something like, bad would have yeah, yeah. yeah uh, you know, of course, uh, it's it just I, I'm trying to understand like what that sensation is like. Number one, number two is when you're out there actually in space. You know, you go, you open the door, you jump out, and now you're 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 out there. You know, is it exciting? Is it scary? Is it what you know? What are those emotions that yeah. that are going through? Yeah. So you know, walking in space is the ultimate astronaut experience. And in fact, in my life, there's nothing that compares to it. I, I it's it's the most exhilarating, incredible uh, life experience that I can possibly imagine. You're actually outside in your own personal spaceship. So the they built a spacecraft around you. You know, everything that you need to sustain life in a space shuttle or a space station has to be on your back or around you because, you know, you're in the, the vacuum of space. And you know, when you're in direct sunlight, it's uh, 300 degrees above zero. When you're in uh, orbital night behind the, uh, the earth in shadow, 200 degrees below zero. So you have this incredible temperature shift in one orbit of the earth. Every 90 minutes you go around the planet and uh, you know, you're just looking through a thin visor uh, out at the enormity of the universe. And you're, you're not really walking. You're actually crawling. You're holding on to handrails and propelling yourself around the outside of the space station, or as in the um, what you're describing, being out on the end of a robotic boom, in a foot restraint, your, your feet are planted in, in this boot plate, and they swing you around like on a cherry picker out to the very tip of the space station. And it's just a, like an out-of-body experience. There's uh, no way to, to really do the, the experience justice, you know, to, to see you know, continents almost in a single glance, uh, to see... Uh, you know, uh, the, the Southern lights, uh, from that vantage point to actually fly through them in your spaceship. Um, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's just, just so, so beautiful, but you know, it's, it's interesting after a while, after training, that spacesuit becomes an extension of your body. So now you, you've worn all sorts of, you know, gear out in the field. Yeah. Um, I'm sure after a while, you don't even think about all the stuff that you got on you. Um, it just is part of your, uh, your exoskeleton and you just kind of go about your thing. And so after a lot and a lot of training, uh, that kind of sensation happens too. And, and you feel like you're just unencumbered, you know, zooming through the universe. It's, it's pretty cool. Are, are you actually hooked in somewhere on the, yeah, right? so we, we have, yeah, we have a, a safety tether reel. It's, it's a steel braid cable basically on a, on a spring that's supposed to retract on one of my spacewalks. It didn't retract and they were concerned that I was going to get all tied up and, uh, it could have been a really b- uh, bad day, quite honestly. But uh, um, we do have a safety tether reel that's always hooked to your uh, spacecraft. And um, even when you're out on the end of a robotic boom, you'll be tethered in some way. Hmm. So that if you become, uh, if you lost you know, your grip on the space station, you could pull yourself back to safety. Hmm. And then we also have kind of a, a, a Buzz Lightyear jet backpack. So in uh, a really bad day, if our tether were to break or something like that, we could pull out, it's kind of like a, an Xbox controller, and fire some jets and fly ourselves back to uh, the space station. Yeah, you know, this, this reminds me a little bit, and I'm sure Hollywood, you know, makes it much more dramatic than what it what it really is, but there's a uh, movie with Matt Damon, and I can't remember, but they, they, they crash on Mars or someplace. And yeah, then the they, Martian. Yeah. The Martian, mm-hmm. yeah, and then they all take yeah. off, and then he has to be this, you know, all these characteristics and attributes that sounds like you have, which is, you know, sustain life and make water and grow plants and all these different things. Right. And trying mm-hmm. to figure out how he can stay alive until the ship can come back and rescue him. So yeah. Great movie. I loved I, it. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I love that movie. I, I, I think he did a great job and it was just fascinating on, you know, I mean, if you put yourself in that position, what would you do? Right. Yeah. D- nothing is a greater motivator than uh, necessity, you know, and, uh, and so that was a, a great movie that kind of highlighted, uh, you know, creativity and, and problem solving. Um, some of the, some of the, the 
the assumptions that went into that movie, uh, it, it's a little bit tough for a guy like me to look at a movie like uh, um, Gravity or yep. Armageddon, where they kind of really stretched the bounds of physics and chemistry and things like that. But I thought The Martian was very, very well done. Really enjoyed it. What's that like to re-enter the atmosphere? Well, and the space shuttle is actually pretty benign. Um, you know, we we have uh, atrophy of our body even over a couple of weeks in space, so we we don't have to work against gravity. We don't have to carry our bodies uh, upright. Uh, our heart doesn't have to pump against gravity either. So our our strength is actually uh, moderately reduced by the time we come back home, even though we exercise about 45 minutes every day. But, uh, you know, the, the G-force on our body, it's, it's about 1.5 Gs from our head down to our toes. So we wear a G-suit that squeezes our belly and our legs that keeps the blood circulating in our system so we can, the pilots up front can land the space shuttle. And you feel reasonably uh, healthy after landing. It takes a little, a few minutes to, before your gyros kind of settle down and before you stand up and, and try and uh, get out of your seat. The real challenge, though, is for the poor folks that come back to, from the International Space Station now. They've spent six or more months up there. My, my friend uh, Scott Kelly just spent 340 days up there. That's a long time without gravity. Yeah. And uh, they come back under four to five Gs uh, of acceleration, really violent. Uh, you know, and, the, and the spacecraft is swaying underneath the parachutes, and, and then it, it slams down onto the uh, hard dirt of Kazakhstan, and uh, the most likely greeting uh, committee is uh, some camel herders, you know. So it's a, it's a very different uh, kind of welcome back home when you wow. fly in a Soyuz. So uh, you, you've been on the Endeavor, though, where it comes yes. back from space, it lands in, where is that, in California? Uh, I landed a couple times in California yeah. at the Edwards Air Force Base. And yep. then three of my flights, we landed at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, and we have a basically a, a five-mile-long runway there. And so that's how how we would come back home. How fast do you, you fly when you come in? So uh, the equivalent airspeed is uh, Mach 25 or 25 times the speed of sound. So, I mean, it, you're hurtling around the planet at 17,500 miles an hour. And what we do is we slow the, the ship down slightly to then uh, start to interact with the upper reaches of the atmosphere. And we kind of slam through the, the atmosphere using the tiles on the belly of the orbiter. And that's why we feel the one and a half Gs. We're kind of coming down through the atmosphere and it, it creates this fireball outside. It's a really brilliant orange. It's, it's an incredible view out the windows. Um, but then after that, once we're um, you know down into the thicker parts of the atmosphere, the aerosurfaces of the the shuttle start to move again. We can use the ailerons and and uh, the elevons and, and the rudder, and uh, we use a speed brake to also slow down. So it, it's coming uh, more like a glider than anything else. But it's it's uh, a glider that flies more or less like a piano or a brick. I mean, it, it has very uh, limited lift over drag. So it's coming down very, very steeply, very, very fast, about 300 knots on, uh, on short final and uh, about uh, 2,000 feet above the ground. Uh, the, the commander will nose the, the shuttle up a little bit and then we'll lower the, the landing gear. We land at about 200 knots, which is much faster than even fighter aircraft have. Um, so you're really zooming. Yeah, well, I, I can't imagine there's a, a flight attendant that's offering you a cocktail and peanuts or something <laughs> on that re-entry, <laughs> <No>. right? <laughs> no, you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> understood, yeah. understood. Hey, last uh, space question here. So, um, you know, I, I admire and look up to, you know, people who have gone before me uh, always. And uh, um, a guy that I'm not sure if he was a mentor to you or just a guy that you happen to, you know, interact with. And um, certainly he, he gives you an endorsement on your book, which is called The Sky Below. Um, John Glenn, what's he like? Yes. Oh my goodness. Well, he, he, one of the greatest Americans of our time, uh, you know, I miss him dearly. He, uh, he and I, uh, really got to know each other when he came back to fly aboard the space shuttle at age 77. So this is a guy that, you know, was my boyhood hero. Um, you know, he was the very first American to orbit the earth. Um, president Kennedy actually told him you're such a national icon, uh, you can't fly again. And, uh, he took the hint and, what are you, you going to do? Well, he reinvented himself. He became a politician, served you know, nobly for uh, four terms in the United States Senate, even uh, was a contender for the presidency at one time. Uh, I won't get into politics. Uh, uh, stay away from that taboo subject. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. a topic for another uh, uh, Or a different show. Uh, time. A different show. There you go. There you go. Uh, 
but re- just a wonderful man. And uh, one of the things I really admired about him deeply is his, his humility and um, his uh, willingness to, to just chip in and be one of one of the crew. Yeah, um, he, he was, of course, uh, yes, revered by all of us. Uh, but when he first came into our office, uh, as the crew is assigned, um, he said to all of us, if any of you guys call me Senator Glenn, I'm going to ignore you. I'm just John or payload specialist number two. He didn't want any, any fanfare, uh, any special attention. And he wanted to contribute to even just the simple housekeeping chores around the space shuttle. Um, he didn't want to just be on the flight to do his science. He wanted to chip in and do everything that he could to help the mission be successful. So just an incredible role model not only to me as a boy, but also as a um, uh, much older now uh, um, retired astronaut, you know, we can contribute uh, significantly uh, throughout our, the course of our lives. And so, you know, John uh, took great risk at age 77 returning to space, but he did so because he wanted to uh, further science. And, um, and, and so I, I think it just goes to show that, you know, we, we can be real contributors in life, uh, uh, even well into our you know, seventies and eighties. Yeah. I, I will, my grandfather was like this. I will be like this. I will never, ever, ever retire. So right. you will literally throw dirt on me, you know, as I'm doing something. <laughs> so it just, yeah. it's impossible for me to do that. And, yeah. you know, we all have to be very purposeful in what we're doing. And I, I, I just believe that, you know, you need to have that drive and that goal and that whatever you're doing, get up in the morning and get after it. Right. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, another thing, just to kind of a side note here, uh, side rift, you know, I, I've, I've had people compliment me on some of the things I've done and, and I literally, and you're probably the same way. I know you're the same way, which is I never get up in the morning and go and look in front of the mirror and, and, and and look at that guy that I'm staring at and say, you know, you're one impressive dude, (laughs) right? It just, (laughs) I I don't, you know, it's just, I don't look at myself. I, I, I look at, you know, I, I haven't accomplished near enough and I, I look back and that's his stuff in the rear view mirror. Um, I don't dwell on it. It's everything is out in front of me. And, Absolutely. Uh, and especially, right, you right. know, when I, you know, I'm inspired by guys like you and others who, you know, there's things that my personal uh, aspirations, but, you know, I, I think that's what keeps you going. So you're talking about the age of 77, you know, I mean, I, I feel like I'm going to go to a hundred. I mean, I'm just starting. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 you, you obviously have uh, incredible gratitude for the good fortune that you've had in your life as well. And so for me, it's kind of like, you know, how, how can I earn the oxygen that I, I breathe? You know, how can I pay it forward? Um, I've been very, very fortunate in my life and, and I want to continue to contribute to society in the best ways that I can and trying to find the, the best, you know, areas for me to focus my energies. But yeah, I'm just so grateful for everything that, you know, first off, I, uh, uh, I'm very grateful that I was born an American, uh, live, you know, to be in a country that dreamed big and had, the opportunities for me to pursue my ultimate dreams of, you know, flying in space. And, and so a country that takes big risks and you know, is willing to, um, to invest in things that are important for, for humanity. And I, I hope we don't lose, lose that, uh, spirit that, that I think is part of the, the American fabric. Um, but again, I'll avoid politics. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Okay. <laughs> uh, it just you know, we could I could spend like literally another hour talking about space with you. It's so fascinating to me. Um, uh, but I want to jump over into your mountain climbing pursuits, right? So you're a guy who's climbed Everest took you, uh, two times to get up, and you've climbed I think all 53 14ers in Colorado. Does that sound right? Yeah, yeah. I, I've climbed. Uh, the, the lists are vary, but uh, they somebody decided well there are actually 59 if you count these sub peaks, and so. Uh, now, being a little bit anal retentive, I said, "Well, I've got to climb those other six too." So I, I went, I went and topped out on those those peaks as well. But so it's just it's an amazing way to see the state of Colorado. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I there's I don't need to do all fifty three or fifty nine, in, in mm-hmm. as you described it, but um, there are definitely some that I, I, I have on my bucket list. That I want to get to Colorado and do beautiful state, yeah. of course. Um, let's talk about Everest. Right. So tell me what that was like for you. And uh, I'm planning to do Everest in 219. And mm-hmm. um, I've had a lot of buddies growing up, as you know, in, in the state of Washington, very um, yeah. there's a huge climbing community up there and whatnot. I spent a lot of time in all those different mountains, um, Rainier and others. And um, anyways, I've had my sights set on this. So I've been kind of slowly going through the seven and uh-huh, uh, uh-huh. getting closer to that goal. So tell me what that was like for you to, to, to be on Everest and the whole experience. 
Well, I, I'm so excited for you, Mark. Um, and I, I, I know from your background that you're actually uh, preparing to do this with, with great diligence and, and you're not um, in, a, in a rush program to, uh, um, to just bag a peak, but it's, it's a journey for you. And, and that's really the right way to do it. And I, I bet we know a lot of the same uh, climbing community up in the Pacific Northwest. It's really kind of the, the, uh, uh, the epicenter of, of climbing in, in the United States. Uh, uh, in fact, I, I ended up going to Everest with uh, IMG and yep. Eric Simonson and his team. Do you, yep. know, do you know Eric? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah, Phil, Phil Urschler. Sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done, uh, I've done uh, all my climbs with uh, IMG except for uh, I was on Denali this last, uh-huh. but they don't have a license up there. So I went through one of the guides for IMG, you know, that got leased out or, yeah. or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Oh, great, great. Well, you know, some of the best climbers on the planet, uh, for sure. But, um, yeah, I draw a lot of strength from my Everest experience. The, um, the first time I went in 2008, I didn't uh, make it to the top. In fact, it could have killed me. Um, I made it up to Camp um, uh, 3, which is at about 24,500 feet-ish. Uh, where we start to use supplemental oxygen, and uh, I had ruptured a disc in my low back. I didn't, I didn't have an MRI or a CAT scanner, but something was really amiss with my back. I was crippled in pain and uh, had to limp down from that point, um, uh, not knowing whether or not I'd ever be able to return. Um, and I'd already, I'd already spent two months on the mountain, basically kind of acclimatizing and, and getting ready to go for the summit. We were on our summit push on day 59 of the expedition. So it was a gut-wrenching uh, horrible time for me, but I was able to uh, come back home and I needed surgery to remove a disc uh, out of my spine. And uh, within a couple of months, I was back at the gym and uh, uh, I still had it in me to, uh, to go try it again. Um, and so fortunately, I was able to, to get back in 2009. And after another two months of you know, pain and suffering, it's, it's a lot of work, as you know, uh, high in the mountains there. But um, I was able to top out on May 20th, uh, 2009 at 4 a.m. in the morning. And uh, I actually saw sunrise from the top of the planet, which is really, really special. Mm-hmm. But um, the thing that I, I bet you can resonate with is that the things that come to us the toughest you know, always mean the most to us. And, and the fact that I had to you know, struggle up one more time uh, you know, and had to figure out a way to get back uh, to Everest the following year and um, and then repeat all the pain and suffering, uh, to attain the summit. Whenever I think I'm having a really tough day, I, I think back on, um, uh, my Everest years and, and realize, you know, I can, I can deal with this. I, I can uh, press on through and, and, uh, make whatever it is happen. So, um, I'm sure you've got plenty of examples of things that you've, you've really had to work for, uh, that, you know, fall in that same kind of category of, you know, injury or or what have you. Yeah, training camp. You know, trying to make it through yeah, six I weeks or two days. You know, there's yeah. nuts. Yeah. You know, my 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 story is a little bit like yours on Denali uh, this last May. Um, you know, it, the the main difference there are no sh- no Sherpas or porters. Um, right. You know, donkeys, anything else to take your stuff up, and so you're dragging. Each guy had 126 pounds on their back going up the steepest. You know, 45 degree. You know, hills. If that's what you want to call them. You know, the slopes and um, you know, put myself in a position like you, um, in this case, it's 16,200 to make that, that summit. And it, you know, it was minus 60 at the top. And it's either two things, as you know, it's either going to be death or you lose fingers or toes. And, you know, that's not an option. So not worth uh, it. No, not worth it. So, you know, mother nature won on that round. And just like it did, it sounded like it was a little bit more physical for you. Um, but it, it, the, the common thread there is just that the amount of work it took to get to that point, you know, all the time spent on the mountain. And then you got to go home. And sure enough, I, I'm going back May, next May to, uh, <laughs> to set, you know, 218. So, yeah, yeah. It is what it is. The goal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, yeah, I mean, I have to do it. I mean, period. Right. Right. So, <laughs> no, it's crazy. So, uh, did you run into any craziness on your second time when you actually did summit in terms of, uh, you know, horrific weather or avalanche dangers or things mm-hmm. like that beyond just the longevity they have to be on the mountain and go through? And, and also, did you, did you yeah. go through any kind of altitude issues? 
I was very fortunate. I, I acclimatized very well, and I, I didn't have any issues uh, either of my seasons on Everest. But uh, um, I, I dealt with a lot of altitude-related illness, actually. As a physician, I treated high-altitude pulmonary edema. Um, I treated uh, uh, coronary insufficiency. Basically, I had a, a teammate who uh, was probably not getting enough blood to his heart. He was developing shortness of breath and chest tightness. Your, your blood, as you spend a lot of time up there, you, you get really sludge-like blood. You build lots and lots of red blood cells because yeah. the air is so, so thin up there. And so I think he might have been you know, potentially about to have a heart attack, so I had to send him down on aspirin and oxygen. There's not a whole lot you can do for someone uh, who's really, really ill up there. You can, you can support them. You can help them uh, as best you can, but you can't carry someone down. And that's the thing that a lot of people don't understand about mountain like Everest, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, at the, at the limit of, of human capacity to, to go up there. And, and, uh, um, so it's a, it's a very unforgiving place. You need to be in peak physical condition. You need to be well hydrated and well nourished. The weather has to be perfect. You have to have strong teammates and looking out for one another. So, you know, it, what, uh, you need to do is apply really good judgment. And so obviously you, you made the right call on Denali. I had to make that call on Everest my first time as well. And so you, you have your wits about you and, and you make the right decision. But there are people up there that uh, have summit fever and, you know, it's, it's their life ambition. The only thing that they have their sights on is, is summiting. Um, but as Ed Vesters would say, you know, it doesn't really count unless you made it a round trip. You know, uh, you know there are 250 plus, uh, probably close to 300 souls now that have perished on Mount Everest and uh, over, over many years of, what is it, um, 60 four years of climbing on Mount Everest yep. for successful summits on Mount Everest. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I've climbed with, uh, Ed and, uh, and uh, so that was a thrill for me. You know, you talk about he's he's kind of like the John Glenn. We're about the same age, but, yeah. you know, just fun to do that with him and engage with him. And that was just a super fun day on Rainier. But, um, yeah, you know, I, I knock on wood because it can always hit you. Um, I don't have any well, – I, I haven't yet had any kind of altitude issues. And actually mm-hmm. when I was on uh, Aconcagua um, down in Argentina at almost 23,000 feet, it felt great. No issues, mm-hmm. you know, which mm-hmm. was, you know, I was very yeah. blessed for that. But, you know, also on Denali, kind of like you, you know, there was a guy that was right in front of me from a German team, and he literally, 30 feet away, just, you know, he's there, and then he just fell over. He had a massive heart attack. Wow. And uh, wow. it was just crazy wow. to, to watch that play out. I was in, uh, I went back with uh, NFL group and Green Bay group um, last February with the project with Chris Long, uh, who plays for the Eagles now. Um, mm-hmm. Last year was mm-hmm. with the Patriots, Howie Long's son. And... Um, and uh, the Green Beret was with us, one of them, and uh, this guy just full-on case of um, pulmonary edema and just literally collapsed and fell. And, I mean, he was in bad shape. So, oh, you wow, know, if, wow. if people don't uh, – and he was taking shots of Dex two days before at lower, ta- at lower altitudes, well, right? And it yeah, wasn't – you know, he was like – yeah, yeah. As a physician, you understand that, you know, it's, it's not like candy. You know, this is like real right. stuff, Right. On, on Everest also, you know, you'll see, and you probably saw in Denali, but uh, daily avalanches. So, you know, the, the circ around, at least the Nepalese side, is very, very dynamic. And, uh, you know, w- with global warming, yes, there is global warming. Uh, you know, the, there is, uh, you know, weakening of the, the ice fall. And so it's a very dynamic area. And, in fact, in 2009, one of the avalanches swept down and killed uh, uh, a Sherpa climber and nearly uh, killed two uh, Austrian uh, climbers that uh, were with him. So, yeah, it's one of those things that you, you, you can um, limit your risk to those things by trying to get through very early in the morning before the sun would hit the, the ice fall, but uh, you can't entirely mitigate that risk. Yeah, no, right on. I, I got to tell you, for the listeners who who obviously you can hear, but you can't see, and Scott and I are doing this via Skype, and uh, there's a video chat, and you actually look right now a little bit like I'm talking to you at the space station <laughs> all the way up there, so it's kind of fade in, fade out. But I want to transition. Oh, yeah, no worries. Um, you know, kind of the last point here. So, uh, so grew up in the Northwest, 
and did a lot of climbing. And five or six years ago, I was going through a really tough time um, in my marriage and my relationship and, you know, certainly driven in a certain way. And I need to go f- refill my bucket in a way that's going to give me some joy and some happiness. And so, you know, that's yeah. where this whole Seven Summit thing came about. And I wanted to become the first NFL guy to do that. And, you know, mm-hmm. all these other things have now come out of it, like this podcast. But, you know, for me, it was just a... A nobody in the history of my family had ever been divorced. And, you know, for me to be that first guy, you know, it was just was humbling and hard and everything else. And so again, you know, we, we, everybody's got their, their, their thing. Um, again, we call this, this podcast finding your summit. And for me, that was metaphorical in the sense of going through a rough personal time, which led me to the mountains, which led me to a lot of clarity and, um, peacefulness in terms of being out there and there's no social media and phones and whatnot, Right. Um, yeah. And, and I, 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 you know, I, I don't want to touch too far on this if you don't want to go there, but it sounds like you had some similar experience, um, with your first wife and now you're happily yeah. married to your second, but, um, you want to talk about that for a minute? Yeah. yeah well, yeah. So, um, again, talking about, you know, failures in life, we, we, we learn from them and, and, uh, they, they shape who we are. It's, it's easy to manage success, but, uh, it's how you, you, you uh, work through the, the failures that kind of define who you are. And, and uh, so certainly one of the, the, uh, the toughest moments or periods of my life was actually uh, the dissolution of, of uh, my first marriage. Uh, um, I have two beautiful, wonderful kids. Uh, my, my daughter, Jenna, is actually autistic, and that adds a degree of, of uh, challenge and difficulty, but she's uh, an incredible joy in, in our lives. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, I, I do talk about um, uh, that period of my life in in a, in a bit of detail. Um, but really, my my book is uh, uh, I don't uh, um, I, I never point uh, point fingers at anyone else uh, at things that haven't gone well in my life. I, I talk about what I've learned from my my own failings, my own contributions to uh, to uh, um, uh, how do how do I put this? Uh, um, I take responsibility for um, the decisions I made and, and the mistakes that I made, and and that's that. That was the kind of theme that I wanted to have for my book. Yeah, I mean, look, we we we're, we're in some sense, I think, two birds of the same feather, and and I, I agree with that. And I I just don't I don't believe that that people that play the victim role. Right. I mean, I take full responsibility for the part that I play. It takes two always. And um, whether it's that or a business I've started um, and things don't go right, you got to take responsibility. And, and like yeah. you said, it's, it's, it's the things that you learn that you, you, you take away and your next venture and your next thing and better perspective and insights and vision. Um, that just makes you a better person and more successful the next time around. Absolutely. And, and so, you know, recovering from that and, and then also uh, finding the love of my life, uh, uh, Mina is, is, you know, my life is, is really, you know, beyond wonderful. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I just pinch myself every day that, you know, I, I, we were able to find each other. And, and so, um, she's a kindred spirit of mine. She's a you know, hiker climber, um, and, uh, just, just great with the kids. So, um, you know, it's, it's a journey. For sure. Yeah. Well, you know, right before we uh, we went live here, we uh, we had a quick chat, and it sounds like she was in an accident a couple of weeks ago, and I'm I'm sure that must have just ripped your heart apart. And you know, fortunately, she's yeah. uh, you you were able to get her back here to the states in a great hospital, and she's doing fantastic now, right? She's doing amazingly well. She's out. Uh, she's a planetary scientist, and so she was doing field research in Iceland, uh, rare, very remote Iceland, and was involved in an automobile accident. She's the backseat passenger and was ejected from the car, horrific uh, kind of potential for, for injury, ended up with a, a fractured pelvis and many other fractures and was life flighted to Reykjavik. And we eventually got her to Mass General Hospital in Boston where she had uh, definitive surgery. And now I've got her back home here in Houston in, a, in rehabilitation and physical therapy. And she'll, she'll be back in about uh, you know, six months back uh, you know, running. And she's already decided she wants to run a half marathon and, uh, get back into doing triathlon. So I, you know, you know, watch out. 
Yeah, yeah. It sounds like she needs to be on this podcast. What a what a great she does. remarkable yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. well, I'll listen. Um I want to let everybody know again, Scott Peroniski and his book is this Yep, yeah, sorry. And then the the book is Sky Below. Um uh, Scott is such a remarkable guy. And um, thank you so much. And I will throw out an invite uh, for you to be on my Denali uh, expedition next May if you're uh, game yeah, for that. I, you might, I might take you up on that. That would be wonderful. I, I, I made it up to 18K on uh, Denali when uh, I had to turn back for, uh, for winds and weather. So it's still on my bucket list. Maybe, yeah. maybe we'll go do that. We need to get that done. Jim Mora, Jim Mora will be on that climb too. So it'll be a lot of fun. Scott, thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thank you so much for tuning in to the podcast this week. We had another great guest, and it is so awesome to continually have these different people on, talk about their different adversity, how they've overcome that, and what they've done to affect change in their life to become very successful. So really appreciate you guys tuning in. As always, we love the rating and reviews that you guys do on iTunes. If you haven't done that, please go do that. It really helps us in terms of increasing our visibility within iTunes. Anyways, it's just fun to share the love and uh, what these different stories, these different people are all about. So make sure you tune in next week. We appreciate it. And that's it. Bye.